featured program today is a very special program for us, and Bill Gates Sr. is going to do the introduction of the main speaker. So I'm not going to take any more time except to say Bill Gates Sr. is an honorary member of our club and an honored member of this club. He is revered by us Rotarians around the world for his leadership in supporting polio eradication and for the values he brings to us. So, Mr. Gates Sr., thank you. Certainly glad I didn't leave the first page behind. <laughs> well, hello, fellow Rotarians. I'm really pleased to be introducing Chris Elias to you today. I've known Chris for a good many years, watching his career unfold at places like the Population Council and then PATH, where he was president and CEO for 11 years. You can imagine our immense pleasure when Chris decided to join the Gates Foundation as president of the Global Development Division. Chris certainly has his hands full at the foundation. He's responsible for our work with grantees and partners to advance many of the foundation's highest priority and strategies, including polio eradication, family planning, and agricultural development. One of the things I especially appreciate about Chris is that he is a passionate figure on the subject connecting the dots between all the work we do at the foundation in a way that makes sense to the, he does that in a sense, that seems to people as if they're trying to serve. This enables us to achieve the most possible impact you can imagine, and I have very much enjoyed watching Chris's dedication and his leadership from afar. And now I have the good fortune to watch him close up at the foundation. So please join me in welcoming Chris Elias. Thanks, Bill. Oh, you can do it without the second page. <laughs> Uh, uh, hello, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, let me thank Steve for the introduction and President Laura and Mark and, uh, and especially Ezra. Ezra's leaving tonight for Ethiopia. I'm going to follow you on Saturday, but um, I'm going to be in Addis and not get out, unfortunately, to be able to join you. I'd love to be with you giving those two drops to children. It's more timely than ever. I mean, I, Ezra and I were talking the last case of a uh, wild polio virus in Ethiopia was some four or five years ago until the new cases in the, in the Agadin uh, as part of the Horn of Africa outbreak that we're seeing this year. What I'm going to do today is, is talk to you about um, one of the, in fact, the highest priority of the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and that is our efforts to join together with the spearheading partners of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, with Rotary International, the World Health Organization, the UNICEF, and the Center for Disease Control, to finish the job on polio eradication. Um, you know, the Rotary began, challenged the world, really, to, to do this back, actually, when I was in medical school. Um, and uh, it's been a long path, and it's been full of great success uh, from hundreds of thousands of children infected with wild polio virus every year to 223 cases last year. We're now down to the details. And so I'll show you some of the details, some of the challenges that I think we face as we reach what's known as the end game. Um, we have the tools. I think we have the political will but we're facing some particular challenges in this final, final uh, mile. Now, the interesting thing about being up here is I can't see the slide, but um, if you see a slide of Bill Gates, then we're on the right slide. <laughs> um, I don't know if many of you recognize this picture. Those of you who have been at baggage claim at SeaTac probably are familiar with it. 
I came back from a trip recently, and every screen at every baggage claim at SeaTac had this picture on it, reminding me that we're this close. Um, and just how close are we? Um, last year, we, were, we had probably the best year in a long time, with only 223 cases, only three countries that have never eradicated or interrupted transmission of wild polio virus, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, uh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria. We're celebrating, we're about to celebrate the three-year anniversary of India being polio free. Now historically, for much of the past decade, people thought India would be the last place because of the large birth cohort, because of sanitation, crowding, the difficulty in reaching access in northern India. And yet India, not without a little bit, a lot of help from Rotary, succeeded. Last, uh, Jan in January of 2014, we'll hit three years, which is when they officially come off the list and are, are considered to be, have, uh, have definitively eradicated polio. But polio, no country is safe until we eradicate polio everywhere. So uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about where we are. And we should now see a map, right? Okay. Um, fortunately, I know that map very well. <laughs> this year, we, you know, if you look at the aggregate figures, we have, um, you could say we have a bit of a setback. We already have more cases in 2013 than we had in all of 2012. Um, and that's because of a very um, important reality, which is that as long as polio circulates anywhere, everywhere is susceptible. So, but we can look first at the good news um, of this year. I, was, I, I currently chair the Polio Oversight Board, which is the main governing body of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Um, it consists of Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Tony Lake, the Executive Director of UNICEF, Tom Frieden, the head of the U.S. Uh, CDC, and Wolf Wilkinson the, um, uh, from Rotary International. My peers uh, uh, elected me as the, as the chair for this year, um, and I recently had an opportunity to meet with the staff in Geneva of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and spend a day with them doing a pretty deep dive into some of the challenges of their operations. And one of the things I said to them is that it, if I look at where we are in polio today, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. The best of times because it has now been almost a year to the day since we saw the last case of wild polio virus 3. We haven't seen any children affected by wild polio virus 3, and we haven't seen any positive sewage samples anywhere in the world. We've never gone this long. Epidemiologically, it's too soon to say we've succeeded, but we may have seen the last of wild polio virus 3. We need some more time, and we're actively surveilling to see if we're missing any of it, but it looks like it's gone. It's no longer anywhere to be found in Pakistan or Nigeria. We also saw considerable success last year, over the course of the last year, in Afghanistan. In 2012, all, most of the cases in Afghanistan were in the south, in Kandahar and Helmand provinces, and there we were missing dozens of thousands of children in the polio campaigns. A concerted effort of, of the various partners in Afghanistan led to success. There has not been a single case of polio in southern Afghanistan this year. The only cases, and there have only been eight cases in Afghanistan this year, they're all in the east, and they're all right along the border with Pakistan. They're essentially, you can think about Afghanistan as having broken transmission where it had it last year, and unfortunately having a new outbreak spilling over the border from Pakistan. So we're really down to two very difficult sanctuaries in western Pakistan and in northeastern Nigeria. But the other good news is if you look carefully there, We've seen progress in the areas where the government has access and has control over the quality of the program. We've seen considerable improvement. Last year, there were cases all over northern Nigeria. This year, there are no cases in the northwest, only a handful of cases in the north center, and most of the cases are concentrated in the northeastern part of Nigeria, um, where there's a state of emergency in the states of Borno and Yobe. Similarly, in Pakistan, we haven't seen any cases in Baluchistan. 
The cases are concentrated in, in uh, the federally administered tribal areas, and in particular, in North and South Waziristan, where the Taliban has had a ban on polio campaigns since the middle of 2012, um, because they're holding the polio campaigns hostage to um, a demand to cessa uh, for cessation of the drone strikes. There are currently hundreds of thousands of children in, those, in North and South Waziristan who are not benefiting from the two drops of polio vaccine that the world is ready to give them. So we increasingly have a problem, a, a political problem of access to children in, in Western Pakistan, Northeastern Nigeria, and because of the new outbreak, the other troubling spot is in, in South Central Somalia. So the reason the map is bigger and the reason we have more cases is because of a large outbreak in the Horn of Africa. It began in Mogadishu about five, six months ago, and it quickly spread to the Somali refugee camps in Kenya and the Dadaab camp and into the eastern part, the Agadan part of Ethiopia. Um, that, that, that outbreak is one of the largest we've seen. It's complicated by difficult access with Al-Shabaab, again, provide, prohibiting access to children to provide life-saving polio vaccines. But where, again, there has been access, like in Mogadishu, we've seen the epidemic peak, and to come back, the number of cases fall just in three to four months, which, compared to the last outbreak in Somalia, took nine months to reach this stage. So where we have access, we are seeing operational improvements. We've seen political and financial commitments that are unprecedented. The Global Polio Eradication Initiative is better funded today um, than it has been um, any time in the last decade. Um, part of what um, the Gates Foundation and, and Bill Gates in particular participated in was pu pulling together world leaders um, in Abu Dhabi at the Global Vaccine Summit in April to get commitments against the six-year final plan for polio eradication and the transition to um, the end game. Politicians, donors, et cetera, showed up in, in Abu Dhabi and made unprecedented commitments. So we're in a better position, even though the map shows more countries affected. We have a fairly large outbreak in the Horn of Africa. We have a new case in Cameroon just last month. But Cameroon has had 14 outbreaks of polio in the last 10 years, and the number, the modal number of cases is one. Cameroon's pretty good at mopping up polio when it shows up from neighboring Nigeria. The most recent and most worrisome outbreak is in northeastern Syria, where because of the conflict in Syria, polio has found its way into the midst of one of the greatest humanitarian crises of our time. Now, Syria had its last case of polio in 1999, it had a very good immunization program with very high coverage and consequently no polio until war tore the country apart. Now there's promising statements yesterday from the Syrian government about creating humanitarian corridors to allow access. Syria should be easy to clean up if we have access to the children. So where I'm optimistic is that if we look at the places that are the, the final sanctuaries, as the independent monitoring board refers to them, We've seen progress. We're going to see outbreaks as long as we don't eradicate polio in Nigeria and Pakistan. We have to keep our eye on those reservoirs, and we have to respond quickly when there are outbreaks outside of the region, either in neighboring countries like, uh, like Cameroon or in more distant countries. We're, we're now at such a final stage of polio that we can we genetically sequence and fingerprint every single virus. So we can tell you where that virus in the Horn of Africa came from. It came from northern, north central Nigeria. We can tell you where the positive environmental samples in Egypt and Israel and the outbreak in Syria and the Horn of Africa uh, and, 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 uh, and Syria came from. And that's from virus that was circulating most recently in Pakistan in the slums of Karachi. So we're applying the, the, the tools of modern science to this final, final end game. And that's the next slide I want to show you, which should be a, a series of maps. One of the things we're doing in northern Nigeria to improve the quality of campaigns is actually we've done um, geospatial mapping, satellite mapping of the entire eight northern states of northern Nigeria. And one of the things we found, if you look at the upper left-hand corner of this, you'll see the 
pretty neat drawn map that was a hand drawn map that was put together by the micro planners for where the teams should go with the villages that they should visit. It all looked like a reasonable way to divide up their work. Except that when you actually map those towns against the actual GIS coordinates, the map was more like the one on the bottom left, which looked like uh, political uh, gerrymandering in Texas. <laughs> um, that the perception of where they were supposed to go was actually quite distorted. And so it wasn't surprising that the teams often didn't make it to half of the households they were on. And if you look closely at the map, there were quite a few hamlets that weren't even on the map. So when we did the GIS mapping of northern Nigeria, we found that 10 to 15 percent of the households weren't even on the maps that the polio workers were trying to access. Now with these refined maps and very carefully planned micro plans, which is what you see on the bottom right, um, you, we've now rationalized and redesigned the teams. We've, we've dealt more than doubled the number of teams of vaccinators in northern Nigeria and use smaller teams, an innovation that we borrowed from India. One of the things that we're doing in both Pakistan and Nigeria is learning from the success in India and applying that to the design of the final operations in Nigeria. And with this, we're, we're achieving uh, better coverage and we see consistently better quality campaigns across northern Nigeria, except again for the Northeast where conflict is interfering. The next slide shows that we can then take those maps and we're giving uh, little GPS uh, devices to the vaccinators. We're currently tracking 8,000 vaccinator teams in over 40 local government areas in Nigeria, targeting those with the poorest performance and the most missed children. And those GPS devices emit a signal every two, two minutes. So we can actually map at the end of the day, the, the vaccinators come back from their daily round these are uploaded into to, uh, laptops, and we can see immediately if they missed a neighborhood or if they didn't go out at all and sat under the tree all day. <laughs> There's been a few of those. Uh, <laughs> and we can take this to the local political leadership um, and say, here, your vaccinators only went to half the town or they only stayed on the main road and didn't get off into the village. So this is how specific we're getting now in order to make sure that the investments that the world is making in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, currently over a billion dollar a year program, are going to succeed in terms of bringing the life-saving vaccine to the children who need it and to eliminate polio transmission in the final three places. Let me go to the last slide. Um, uh, this is another poster about um, how close we are. And, and, and it's really where I'll end so that we have time for questions, because I know there's a lot of very experienced polio people here will have uh, questions for me. What I think is different, and the reason that I'm optimistic, is that when we convened the Global Vaccine Summit in Abu Dhabi, we saw an uncommon uh, diversity of people join the, this incredible fight that, polio, that, that Rotary and the other spearheading partners have been leading for over 25 years. We saw groups like the Islamic Development Bank come and commit to providing funding, uh, concessional loan funding to Pakistan. We saw the government of Pakistan borrow money from the Islamic Development Bank to pay for its own program, which was one of the key successes in, in India. We saw Islamic leaders, such as the one pictured on this, bu this bulletin board, or this um, uh, 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 advertisement, um, getting the message out, countering some of those uh, false rumors that have often led to refusals and denial at the, at the community level. We now have a much greater coalition of people with us for this last mile of, of eradicating polio. And so that's one of the things that makes me optimistic, that and the progress we're seeing in the endemic countries. The outbreaks are important. They're going to require urgent response. The goal of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative is to stop every outbreak within six months. But we can't be discouraged by the outbreaks. Um, the outbreaks are going to happen um, as long as we have wild poliovirus anywhere in the world. In fact, the, the six-year plan anticipates one to two significant size outbreaks every year and budgets for it. So we're, we're, we're responding to the outbreaks. The outbreaks are getting most of the media attention. But the real fight is in the final sanctuaries in western Pakistan, northeastern Nigeria, and south central Somalia. 
where politics and in a, in a cruel sense of denying children the ability to be free from the risk of polio in the name of political ends is hampering the, the program's access. If it weren't for those politics, we'd be done by now. So we're, we're on track, I think. It's going to be challenging. And we at the Gates Foundation are very happy to have Rotary as an important partner. As, as Ezra mentioned, um, we recently made a six-year commitment to Rotary International to help um, match two to one contributions uh, toward the, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative over this six-year period of the final strategic plan and endgame. And we're also very proud to be working directly with, uh, with Seattle 4 uh, through a partnership with the Global Poverty um, uh, Project. This is um, uh, the largest and fourth oldest uh, and one of the most active um, Rotary Clubs in, in international and global health issues. And we're very proud to partner with Steve and other colleagues in, in being able to get the word out. Because as we get down to the final point uh, challenge, it's very important for political leadership in our country as well as in the endemic countries to understand that the final obstacles are more political than medical. Um, there, it's about access more than it is about whether we have the right tools. The tools have worked in 99.9% .9 of the rest of the world. They'll work in these places if we're only given access to those children to give them those two life-saving drops that Ezra's on his way to, to deliver in, in Ethiopia with many of you. So let me stop there and open it up for questions. And thank you again for your dedication. Thank you for your persistence in this fight. Thank you. Laura, I think you were going to come help the questions. I just wondered why North Korea is not on the list, and is it just too far north? Uh, no. Um, north Korea actually um, has a pretty good uh, vaccine immunization coverage rate. So the key thing, um, it, one of the things we do is we produce a red list, which is the places that are vulnerable. Um, the places that sometimes keep me up at night. Uh, because we were worried about the Horn of Africa for the last two years. It was like a tinderbox. We knew that Al-Shabaab had over half a million children they were denying access of the vaccine to. So it was not a surprise when a spark from northern Nigeria landed in, in Mogadishu that a fire got started. Right now, we worry about a lot of places. We, we worry about the Central African Republic, where conflict has melted down, and it's not that far from Nigeria. Um, I was at a, in Geneva on Monday, and um, uh, my European colleagues alerted me to the fact that the routine immunization system in the Ukraine, of all places, appears to be in great decline. And so there's that Ukraine is on that list of red, vulnerable countries because it's letting its routine immunization grow weaker. Um, places like Mali, where again, conflict has, has, they had a weak program to begin with, and conflict set it back even further. So we, we have a list. We, you know, actually about a third of the resources that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative spends are in non polio endemic countries trying to prevent and reduce the vulnerability so that we don't have new outbreaks. But until we break the transmission of wild polio virus, we're going to have outbreaks in some places. Hopefully, like Cameroon, we'll be able to clean them up quickly. Could you expand a little bit on the uh, reference you made to a spark that moves from one country to the other? Um, naively, is this a person who wanders across? How, how does that spark yeah. get over many miles? Yeah, it's a person um, who has the wild polio virus in their, um, in their intestinal tract. So polio spread through poor sanitation. Um, um, one of the challenges with polio, and this is what makes it much harder than smallpox, which is the only other disease, human disease that was eradicated, is that for every case of paralytic polio, there's a, a hundred or so asymptomatic cases. So, um, you know, people get infected with the virus, it replicates in their gut, it sheds out of their gut, um, and it can transmit to other people, um, even though, you know, only one in 100 actually develops paralytic polio. So somebody who's been from an endemic area, like in the case of the Horn of Africa, it was presumably somebody from uh, Jigawa, uh, which was the last time we saw that vaccine, that virus, that strain, that genetic strain of virus, 
um, showed up in, in Mogadishu, um, whether they went there directly or through some other place. But given the, the this is where, you know, the interconnectivity of the world and how, how much people are moving and flying around, and you can go anywhere in the world in about 20 hours, uh, makes it imperative that we finish the job in polio. Another question here. Dr. Elias, thank you very much. This has been inspiring, and it's been a privilege and an honor to go on one of the trips. In thinking about the difference between poliovirus type 1 and type 3, you think you may have accomplished the goal for type 1, but not for type 3. What is the lesson that you see in that difference? What is driving that difference? So as you probably know, there are three strains of wild poliovirus, one, two, and three. Um, and uh, they have different levels of robustness in terms of their infectiousness. Um, so wild poliovirus type two was stopped circulating over 10 years ago. So for the last decade, we've been dealing with just one and three. Um, and uh, and the, the, the vaccine you know, has, has uh, uh, components against the typical drops either have uh, uh, you know, vaccine against one and three, or sometimes we use one, two, and three um, uh, to uh, uh, prevent any reemergence of, of type two. But um, is it? so um, the uh, so type three, you know, is, is a little less robust than type one, and I think that the you know we're just. Uh, one of them had to go next, so that we're down to the last one. <laughs> Thank you, George. Any other questions? I, I too have been on several of the polio trips, and I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I have this question to ask. But the two drops that are given to the children, how long do they last? Because <laughs> are those kids re-inoculated each time there's an outbreak, or? Yeah, I, you know, the challenge is that the oral poliovirus is a, a live attenuated vaccine. And uh, like a lot of oral vaccines, it depends on the, what's going on in the gut of the child, on their nutritional status, and on whether there are other things it's competing with. So whereas three doses is the standard uh, course in routine immunization, three doses is usually enough in healthy uh, children. Um, in many places, we've seen kids with 10, 15 doses who still don't have immunity. It's why part of the, so it, there's no, it's a very inexpensive vaccine and it's very safe. Um, and so many children, particularly in high risk and endemic areas, receive multiple doses. Part of the six year end game um, process uh, plan is to ultimately transition from the oral polio vaccine, which is very helpful and, and, and convenient to use in campaigns, to the injectable form of the vaccine. The injectable form of the vaccine is a killed vaccine. It's highly immunogenic. It's what we use in routine immunization here in the United States now, but it requires an injection. So when you incorporate it into routine immunization, you can use the injection where you're have health workers who are giving other injections. As long as we're having to do these campaigns, we're going to be dependent on the oral vaccine, which isn't as effective as the injectable vaccine. And for particularly malnourished kids with a lot of other infections in their gut, they may need multiple courses of the vaccine before they actually get immunity. Thank you. The last question here. Thanks so much, Chris, for being with us uh, today. Could you talk a, a little bit about the role of the U.S. government in the global, global eradication campaign? So the U.S. government plays a variety of important roles. So one is that it's one of the major funders of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Um, and so that's important. And, uh, you know, given the, uh, the annual budget fights, it's important that, you know, hopefully we sustain and, uh, uh, that support over time. The other thing that uh, the, the United States government does, which is quite critical and often underappreciated, is that the U.S. Center for Disease Control secunds dozens of staff to, so a lot of the key people, the, the person who currently runs the polio program at the World Health Organization is a U.S. CDC secundee. So there are 
there are people both in Geneva and in New York and in the field that are actually U.S. government employees through the CDC that are seconded to the other partners like WHO and UNICEF. And that's a very important contribution technically in terms of making these strategic choices about where do we target, how do we schedule, how, you know, what's the trade-off between frequency of campaigns and the quality of campaigns, you know. So some of the things we debate, for instance, in Nigeria are, you know, do we do 11 campaigns or do we step back to nine and, and give people more time to plan? Would that re result in, in greater coverage? So uh, both the technical scientific leadership of the United States and the, 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 the funding that the United States provides as one of the largest donors to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative are important. Um, and then thirdly, you know, uh, the, you know, being an advocate in, in uh, important fora like, you know, uh, you know, uh, like the World Health Assembly to, to you know, where last year um, uh, polio was one of the first diseases declared a global public health emergency, which then helped to, to motivate certain procedural changes within the UN that have been facilitating the end game. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health. <laughs>